With the Big 12 set to add eight new teams, BYU, Cincinnati, Houston, and UCF this year, and Arizona, Arizona State, Colorado, and Utah next year, it's a fair bet that fans of these teams might not be too familiar with some of their conference mates. I can't speak for some of the other members, but as a recent graduate of Kansas State, I do feel like I'm at least a little bit qualified to introduce some of you guys, or I guess in Colorado's case, reintroduce, to the Wildcats of the Flint Hills. This video won't be a deep dive on K-State, more like just a broad overview of everything you'll need to know as a Big 12 member about the university, its sports teams, and its cultures. So, let's start at the beginning. Kansas State University is a land-grant university, the first of which was established under the 1862 Morrill Act, dedicated in 1863 as Kansas State Agricultural College. Built and established by staunch abolitionists, it was just the second to allow both men and women equally from day one, and also allowed black men and women, also from day one. It is located in Manhattan, Kansas, which is off the interstate by a few miles. The turnoff for the town itself is located near Fort Riley, a military fort which has had close connections with Kansas State for many years. It presides over research for the nearby Kansa Prairie Conservationary Site in an area known as the Flint Hills. Given its staunchly agricultural background, it's no wonder that K-State continues to be characterized as a farm school to this day. And while it has continued its excellence in the agricultural sector, look no further than the newly built National Bio and Agri-Defense Building and the so-called Silicon Valley of Biodefense, it has also garnered a reputation for being the place in state for prospective engineers, teachers, business people, and other STEM sector graduates. K-State's campus is what makes Manhattan the happiest place on earth, or Manhappiness, given its small size aside from the university. Just off campus is Aggieville, sort of like a miniature power and light district, with easy access to bar hopping and other college town festivities. Check it out. K-State's been a member of the Big 12 since before it was the Big 12. They've been in a conference with Iowa State and KU for over 100 years, back before the formation of the Big 6 conference, and have stayed a member of the conference and its forms since then. Big 7, Big 8, Big 12, and I guess now the Big 16. If you ever make it down to Manhattan for a game, you might see some fans doing this sort of funny little dance, all together, looking kind of like pistons in a train going back and forth on propulsion. That's on purpose. This is the Wabash Cannonball, and its backstory is fairly interesting. The story goes, a fire overtook K-State's music department in 1968, burning through every piece of music in storage, save for one piece, which was the Wabash Cannonball, which was then used like Boomer Sooner for the next few sporting events. Since then, it's been played at nearly every game the band's been at, and represents the resiliency and determination of Kansans and our Wildcats by extension. So yeah, it looks funny, but it suddenly isn't really all that funny when it's the fourth quarter and you're down by 20, and the entire stadium starts emoting on you. Speaking of the band, that's the pride of Wildcat land. They've always been pretty good, with the accolades to show for it. Then there's this guy. This is Willie the Wildcat. He's been K-State's mascot since 1964. Before then, the college was represented by a real bobcat named Touchdown and a black lab named Bosco, as well as a costumed mascot named Sparky. Before this Willie showed up, though, we had nightmare fuel. So uh, just be glad this is the dude that'll be doing push-ups. He also dresses up for specific sporting events. Some of these sporting events are special, like football's Harley Day and Fort Riley Day they do every season. The fans get really hyped up for these games, and occasionally K-State will even do alternate uniforms or make some small changes for these games. On alternates, take a look at these beauties. A while back in the 70s, K-State's unis for basketball were these two-tone purple and lavenders that the fan base just loves. They brought them back to loud fanfare in 2018, then changed it once the NCAA nixed two-tone unis to flat lavender. Since then, it's been adopted as a tertiary color by baseball, as well as track and cross country, and it's only a matter of time before it gets put into football in some capacity, too. K-State wasn't always the Wildcats, though. They just earned this name in 1915 after a football coach praised his team for having the veracity of a group of prairie wild cats. It didn't stick, though, and they alternated between being known as the Aggies and Farmers for a few years until 1920, when they formally adopted Wildcats with a space. That space didn't last very long, though. All right, let's get this out of the way. Before 1989, Kansas State was not very good at football. That might even be underselling it, actually. They were far and away the worst Division I football program of all time, making one total bowl game from its inception to 1989, which was a loss in the 1982 Independence Bowl to Wisconsin. K-State had been a solid but not great team up until head coach Lynn Pappy Waldorf left in 1934 to lead the other Purple Wildcats, 
after which the wheels totally fell off. So much so that prior to 1989, Kansas State football's total record was 299, 509, and 41, a league-worst 370 winning percentage, and had not won a game in two full seasons. The NCAA was seriously considering forcing the team to either drop football or fall to Division II due to poor attendance, and money troubles at the university left them with facilities worse than nearby high school teams. Sports Illustrated dubbed them Futility U. Then the staff hired some guy named Bill, and everything got crazy. Bill Snyder did the impossible, leveraging his own money to help build K-State's facilities and brought the Wildcats from 1-11 in 1989 to 9-2-1 in 1993 to pushing for a national championship consistently by 1997. His K-State teams won 11 games six times in seven seasons from 1997 through 2003. Just don't mention 1998 to K-State fans. He won K-State's first ever Big 12 championship, its first conference championship since 1934 in 2003. This isn't like Nick Saban taking a down on their luck blue blood Alabama and turning them into the greatest college dynasty of all time. No, this was a man taking a high school team and turning them into a consistently competitive team. He was, quite literally, one of, if not the best program builders in college athletics history. He might not have the national championships to show for it, but K-State, and maybe Manhattan, wouldn't be in the shape it is today if he hadn't turned it all around. Since hiring Snyder in 1989, K-State is 262-157-1, and a winning percentage of 600. The craziest thing about him is that he didn't just do it once, he did it twice. Upon retiring at the end of the 2005 season, K-State replaced Snyder with up-and-coming head coach Ron Prince. Despite having an absolutely stacked coaching staff, the Prince experiment flamed out horrendously. So in order to right the ship, K-State brought Snyder back. He proved them right again by winning a second conference championship in 2012, with current offensive coordinator Colin Klein under center. He retired in 2018, not only the winningest coach in school history, but probably the only coach in school history really worth much of anything. Until now. He was replaced in 2019 by Chris Kleiman, who had spent the last handful of years maintaining the FCS Death Star in Fargo, North Dakota State. Kleiman so far has been an excellent coach, leading the Cats to another conference championship in 2022. K-State has met a few of the new teams on the gridiron before. While they've never played Utah or Houston before, they've played a handful of exciting games against some of the newbies, like the 2002 Holiday Bowl versus Arizona State, the Lockett Game Winner versus Cincy in 1994, the UCF Storm game in 2010, and a bowl loss to BYU in 1997. K-State plays their home games in the 50,000 capacity Bill Snyder Family Stadium, which, yes, Bill did coach in while it was named that. Weirdly enough, the first athletic event in Big 12 history was a football game between K-State and Texas Tech in 1996. K-State will welcome UCF to the new Big 12 in Manhattan this season. Crazy how history echoes, isn't it? When you think of basketball in the state of Kansas, I can't exactly blame you for looking somewhere a bit east of Manhattan. With four total NCAA tournament national championships to K-State's total of zero, it's clear that the Jayhawks' resounding success makes K-State's underrated history look pitiful in comparison. And it is true that K-State doesn't have any basketball natties, and in fact haven't reached the national championship game since 1951 where they lost to Kentucky. But it is entirely possible that Kansas State might be one of the greatest basketball programs in college sports to have never won a national championship. Both the men's and women's teams play in Bramlage Coliseum right across from the football stadium. The men's team has a winning record of just under 60%, which is admirable considering the team was awful from the early 90s all the way through the mid-2000s. K-State has reached the Final Four four times, the Elite Eight 14 times, and the Sweet 16 18 times, which is very successful. But in a basketball powerhouse conference like the Big 12, it just doesn't feel all too impressive if they don't have a trophy in their case. Names like Jack Gardner, Tex Winner, Jack Hartman, and Long Kruger held the post as K-State head coach in the past, leading players like, well, Long Kruger, but also NBA Hall of Very Good players like Bob Boozer, Rolando Blackman, Mitch Richmond, and Michael Beasley. But that one 15-year stretch did real damage to a K-State brand that had up until that point been very good since it happened right as basketball television exploded. 
Some of you may remember, though, the one-year wonder that was Beasley under Frank Martin, who also coached a great K-State team that included Jacob Pullen and Jamar Sanders. After a lengthy but only occasionally successful run under Bruce Weber, who won two regular season Big 12 championships, the Cats turned to longtime Baylor assistant coach Jerome Tang in 2022. Tang's first season was a success, featuring a very entertaining brand of basketball that might continue to cause headaches for teams in the new Big 12, but only time will tell if he can be the guy that can finally bring K-State its long overdue national championship. Those who pay attention to women's ball might have recently heard K-State in the news due to Ayoka Lee, a big who recently set the single game scoring record at 61 points in 2022. The women's team has an overall winning percentage over 60% and is in the top 20 of all time winningest women's programs, but similarly doesn't have the hardware to show for a relatively under the radar history. In fact, they've never passed the Elite Eight, but have won the WNIT once. Interestingly enough, before the NCAA or the Big 12 started sponsoring women's sports, K-State often played KU, Wichita State, and other in-state schools in a sort of interstate conference. They won it eight straight times. Once the Big 8 started sponsoring women's ball in the 80s, K-State joined them and have won the Big 12 conference twice. They do have some interstate heroes in the Raptors too, including Shaylee Lenning, Nicole Oldie, and Kendra Wecker. This upcoming season looks to be stacked, so it could be one of the best Wildcat seasons in a long time, if you knock on wood. Lee returns from injury to a similarly talented offense. Head coach Jeff Mitty will look to finally break the Elite Eight barrier this year, but again, only time can tell how a season will go. K-State plays their baseball games at Toynton Family Stadium, right across from the new basketball facility in the football parking lot. K-State baseball has never quite managed to put it all together as a program and hovers at around 500 all time. One of their most important historical players, though, is the first black Big 8 baseball player, Earl Woods, who's the father of Tiger Woods, who didn't go to K-State for golf and what will always be a cosmic tragedy. Their all-time best season was 2013, which was the last time they advanced to a postseason Super Regional and won the conference championship. Volleyball is the struggle bus team in Manhattan. They're only recently improving as a program, having started their upward trajectory in 1994 under Jim Moore. They just recently announced moving on from 20-year head coach Susie Fritz in 2023, so there's hope that new coach Jason Mansfield can continue to improve the program in its brand new state-of-the-art arena just across from Bramlage. The track and field program might be the most successful program in K-State history. Their space is right across from the new volleyball facility. While it has no team national championships, it has myriad individual champions. From its inception in 1904 through 2016, 37 individuals had won national championships wearing purple and white. They compete both outdoor and indoor, as most programs do. One of their most prominent spokespeople is former cat Eric Kennard, who won second in the 2016 Olympic high jump behind a doping Russian, so I guess that means he won gold. Good job, Eric! Similarly to track, K-State's cross-country programs have also featured periods of success. The Cats have also started a relatively young women's soccer team within the decade, replacing an equestrian team in 2016, who play at the new Buser Park, adjacent to the football stadium. The men's golf team is a program on rocket fuel and has consistently improved year after year. Once we leave NCAA jurisdiction, though, K-State becomes one of the most talented programs in the country. This is mostly due to its most elite dynasty, which is crop judging. I'm not kidding. Which has won a total of 31 national championships during its existence, including 20 in the last 25 years. It's absurd. Following crop judging, K-State also succeeds in other produce judging, like meats evaluation and livestock judging. Outside the judging ranges, K-State has also proven to be a mainstay in bass fishing, winning three natties there, and are rapidly improving in the club rugby, lacrosse, and esports circuits. Welcome to the Sunflower Showdown, where everybody hates each other. It's one of the oldest rivalries west of the Mississippi River, and has been played consistently and long enough for nobody to agree on all-time records. All I have to say about why K-State fans are so animatedly passionate about hating KU is this. They wave the wheat that we grew, and then belittle us as the farm college. It goes back further than that, though, way back to the beginning of the two universities, where Lawrence officials tried their hardest to not just keep Manhattan from getting the state university, but from existing as a town in the first place. KU started putting effort into their athletic programs way earlier than K-State, which is why they have leads in sports like football, despite both programs being such unmitigated garbage programs for the first 80 or so years of their existence. 
Like seriously, both Kansas schools football teams were so bad that it was frequently referred to not as the Sunflower Showdown, but as the Toilet Bowl. In fact, up until around the 80s, K-State and KU were on pretty equal footing basketball-wise, but money troubles at K-State caused the entire athletic department to sink, and when Snyder came in, booster money went towards football, not basketball. So KU got richer in basketball, while K-State decided to spread the wealth more evenly to its basketball department's detriment. Similarly to how much we apparently hate KU, we also apparently hate Iowa State, though this is only a recent development. For the longest time, the rivalry between the two was more friendly since both colleges had similar backgrounds and successes in similar areas up to that point. Then came the mid-2010s, and the terrible thing known as the internet gave way to the terrible thing known as keyboard warriors, and the online bickering between the two fan bases gave way to actual beef. Around that same time, it began to be known as Farmageddon. <laughs> no, I'm serious, Farmageddon. Everybody hates this game because it always etches years off our lives in every sport it's played. These are the only two official rivalries K-State has. While games against teams like Nebraska and Colorado grew testy at times and I'll be deep in the cold, cold ground before I recognize Missouri. Those rivalries really failed to develop as much due to those schools leaving the conference. Maybe with Colorado returning, a new rivalry can be formed, but it'd likely be on the same level of the rivalry K-State has with Oklahoma State, the other Big 8 school still in the conference. Which is to say, not really too much of a rivalry. That being said, there is a sort of camaraderie amongst the former Big 8 schools still in the conference. Like, we hate each other, but we want to keep hating each other, and also our cousins go to those schools, so we don't hate them too much, just enough. It's hard to explain. We do hate Tech for taking our beef judging natties away, though. Stupid, stupid raiders. And that's the short overview of your new conference neighbor, K-State. I probably won't be making any videos for the other schools since K-State's the only school I really know and feel comfortable enough being put in a position to introduce to people. For those new seven fan bases and returning Colorado, I hope you learned something new about K-State today. I'll go back to making conference videos here soon, but I do have a plan to talk about a K-State team that warrants a return to at some point in the future. As always, thank you for watching, be civil in the comments, and I'll see you next time.